Thrive Family, I just released my new book, There Is a War, How to Win the Battle Over the Masters of the Soul. I want you to be aware and attentive of the war after your soul. And my prayer is that this book will help you. Forward by Nathan Finocchio, afterward by Pastor David Campbell. You can find it on Amazon Kindle version or paperback. Thank you for the support. Here's today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Thrive, where I believe you were not created to survive, but to thrive. And if you change yourself, you can change your world. I'm your host, Alex Sagat. Today on the podcast, we have the one and only John with us. Let's go. It's this an honor. This is JP. This is John, my brother, a friend of mine, uh, a brother in the faith now for a very long time. We've been, been doing, doing this for a while. Together. It's an honor to have you here, bro. Oh, man. I'm honored to be here. Seriously. I, love you. I don't take it lightly. Yeah, well, I mean, you've been, you've been on the podcast. No, but still. We've done a couple of, I still, think, it's other always things. an honor to be Thank here. Thank you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How's everything? Thank How's life? Life is great. Yeah. I think. Uh, Right now, we're just, I feel like in a season where I think as a home, as a church, as a family, like everything is just on an upward. Yeah. Like everything is just going good. And um, seriously, I, I, my, my wife, she's a teacher and, and just seeing that she's having an incredible school year, um, it like just brings that much more joy to the house. And and so- Because being a teacher good. is not It easy. is. I tell her she's a hero every day. Yeah. Every day ours, every you teacher. You know, one of our good friends, Corral, yep. she's a teacher as well. And yeah, there's some times where you just get this- bad class uh some students are just extremely difficult and if you have three four five of those yeah uh, uh teachers my respect to them my hats off to them uh they it's not easy to be a teacher what yeah. what grade does andrea teach? so she does kindergarten okay. and uh this is i think year six for her i think it was a couple years ago she had like a really tough tough classroom i think I remember talking uh, about this yeah and it was just where a lot of the students were um either on different sort of spectrums or, or yeah. all different types of things. And it was just a lot of behavioral issues. She was literally getting hit in class. Like oh there was just, God. she was coming home stressed. And uh, that's the last thing you want to do. You, you don't want to see wow. your, your wife stressed. You don't want to see all that. And so, um, yeah, but now just seeing like how much joy she has, it's almost like God has restored Dude, the love for awesome. teaching again. And so it's been really cool. It's been really, awesome. really awesome. I can't imagine, you know, um, I, I don't think I would ever be able to be a teacher of that many students. I've had like, Years ago, I did like a Sunday school class, you know, and so, but it was like five, six kids and it was me and an assistant. We would take them out to play sports. We'll come inside, teach a class. You know, I like, it was at a small Spanish church that I was a Sunday school teacher. I yeah. can't imagine Monday through Friday teaching what, 20, no, 30 students. No, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. I did. I coached basketball for a while. Um, and so I started off with nine and under and like, they're still cool. Like at nine, eight years old, they were cool. Yeah. Parents were probably the toughest, um, at that age. That's but, what, you know, it's funny. Everybody tells me the same thing. Yeah. That it, sometimes it's not even the students. It's the parents that are the most difficult. Guaranteed. A wow. thousand percent. So, I, you know, but I want to live with that in like the <clears> forefront of my mind because we're now parents. Right. And so it's like, man, I don't want to be that parent that the teacher looks at as like, uh, oh, here he comes again. He's oh, going to say Alex something. Sagat. Yeah. Gosh. Or Diane, you know, and we, we're, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we become difficult parents. So I hope I have compassion on teachers. And, oh, for sure. Um, it, I mean, but it's not easy. Yeah. No, I told my wife, like, hey, the day you're a parent, like you better be yes. kind. Yes. And uh, you, you know what? Talk about parents being difficult. Do you remember uh, one Easter? I think we did it two years. We did an egg drop. Oh yeah, helicopter yeah. egg drop. Yeah, it was chaos. It was the, great. It Amazing. was phenomenal. Yeah, as far Thousands but it was people. chaos as far as the parents are the ones For that sure. caused all the chaos, like pushing other parents, kids. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was insane. This was maybe six, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, that helicopter egg drop was absolutely phenomenal. I think. It thousands of people come out for sure. And I think it was like we had like four or five thousand, like yes. four thousand that day or something. And the ones who made it the most challenging, the ones who were putting the most problems, were the parents. And again, not all kids of them, are like, "Yo, there's a freaking helicopter above me." Yeah, but, they were having the time yeah. of their life. But the parents, I remember what you said, pushing one another, angry because somebody got in front of them, and it's like parents just. And again, not all of them. There's a handful that can make yeah. things extremely difficult. So it's like, Lord, help me. I don't want to be like, I want to be like Jesus. Yep. And I get it. You know, you can, something can get you, you know, upset or whatever. Uh, but yeah, anyways, hard out yeah. to teachers. No, for uh, sure. Because it's not easy. So she's been doing that for six years now. Yeah, six years now. It's wow. crazy. But she's good. She's, she's good, doing good great. class. No, yeah, she's doing great. How long have you guys been good. married now? Uh, so Tuesday, we hit four years. Nice. Yeah, Happy Tuesday. anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Four, four years. years already. Yep. So well, we're... I, re you know, it's funny. I remember you and Andrea being um leaders when me and diana were youth pastors that's right 
Was that already nine years ago, 10 years ago? It was. Uh, so funny. I just, I just thought of this right now. Um, we went to lunch. Uh, no, you were, you were doing an offering encouragement at a conference and it was me, you, and a couple other guys that are my age. And we went to this conference. We were all wearing denim jackets. Like, I re- remember. Yeah, so remember that picture? Yes. Um, we're going to have to pull up that picture somehow. Yes. Um, we're all wearing denim jackets. We go out to eat after, and we had gone to this event that I think Mikey was throwing, um, and Andrea was at the event, and you, were, you asked at the table, like, hey, like, none of you guys would try for Andrea. We're all single dudes. <laughs> and uh, in my head, I kind of felt like, hey, I feel like there could be something there. I always sat, my family always sat on the second row if you're facing from the stage left side, her parents always sat on the third row. So we always would kind of go say hi to each other. We were serving together. Yeah. Um, and I was like, Hey, you know what? Maybe, but that was one of the first things that like, was like, Hey, you know what? I'm gonna put some, wow. maybe attention on this. Hey, you know what, John, you're welcome. Second. You're hey. welcome. <laughs> so, um, well, so you know there, there was that. Uh, I, I see myself, right? Like who I'm becoming. And I'm, you know what they always say? Like at the more you live, the more you see, you become like your parents or you become, yeah. Um, you become like certain people that you used to laugh at or make fun of or whatever. Or, you know, it's all in, in, in good fun. But I remember I in this small little Hispanic church that I was a part of, um, our pastor was one that would love like hooking people up. Like, hey, you should date this one. You should date this. And he loved, like he had fun like getting. And I, I find myself now like that, like especially with some of the young guys that I love that I'm like, man, they're still single. Listen, why don't you go invite so and so to a coffee? Yeah. Come on, man. Like, I don't, I want to see my dudes winning and Hey, what? And so I, number one, I forgot that specific moment, yeah, but, yeah. but I do do that a lot. And I, I have like, a love hate relationship. Like Alex, why do you do like we're a connector? But now think out that is the same way. Me and Dana will be, me and Dana sometimes we'll be in like the room and we'll look around at some like, like a leader's meeting. And we're like, Hey, what do you think it's about so and so? And she'll do it too. And we just love playing, like you know, a couple. Of Andre and I live to match make too. Oh, you guys like do that it. is like it's our favorite best. thing in the world, especially doing when we're because right now we have a uh, married young adult couples okay. group, um, which is like the been the greatest thing on the planet. But awesome. before that, it was just young adults. So at one point, we had like. 50 people in this young adults group wow. and we're like, Hey, we're going to try to match make everybody <laughs> and we're going to try to get everybody. It. So yeah, that's like our favorite thing to do in the no, entire world. So I we're with you too. I, I can't believe that story. Uh, I think you yeah. shared it to me once now that, that you told it again. I remember you told me that story, but I don't remember <clears> it like specifically that night. Uh, I do remember both of you just being part of our youth group yeah. leading there. Um, so and you, you were always just a very, you know, solid dude. You loved I the Lord. That. You were serious and Andrea the same. Andrea's always been, uh, you know, uh, reserved, quiet. Like, you know, she's yeah. been um, a girl that you can tell has character or whatever. 100%. And so maybe that night, that's why I thought you guys would yeah. would be perfect together. And it's funny because uh, I remember you held a leaders meeting at your house uh, for all the youth leaders. And so Andrea was a new leader. We were just talking. She wasn't driving at the time. And so I picked her up, but we weren't telling anybody we were talking. So <laughs> we went ahead and left her in the front. I kind of like went around and I was like, all right, I'm going to wait a few minutes <laughs> to lying. actually walk in. That is So that way we walked in separately. No uh, way. But yeah, yeah. We went. So this is a funny story. We started talking in probably about November of 2015 and people didn't start finding out till uh, a conference in June. Wow. Okay. So you guys went that long without We went that anybody. long without telling anybody. So it was just like our family. Was there knew. a reason for that? Um, as a young guy, I didn't want to ever be known as somebody that was like talking to a bunch of girls. Very good. So that was, uh, just something I, I never wanted to be known as. And I think Andrea too, I, I was Andrea's first boyfriend. I was her first kid. I was first everything until, you know, marriage and, and, uh, you know, we used to call that the guys who used to date a lot of girls back in the day at church, Pentecostal playboys, Pentecostal playboys. <laughs> Remember FLF front lobby fellowship? <laughs> <laughs> FLF pros. If Ricky's watching this, he'll die yeah, right now. Ricky knows. <laughs> so, so just to give a little context, so people have no idea what we're talking about. Okay, so I was I got married since I was uh, 24. I got I was 24 when I got married to Diana. So by the time I'm a youth pastor and I have a lot of these young awesome guys around me, they're not married. <coughs> so guys like John, uh, Ricky, so and so, a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. So I would literally be like, "Hey, come on!" Like you know, one of the things that I don't like of today's generation um a lot of guys aren't stepping up to the plate they're they're quiet they're reserved they don't date so again i grew up in church um and obviously at least some of my friends that i remember none of them were pentecostal playboys not like you date a bunch of girls but if you like a girl approach her tell her take her out to have some coffee invite her out yeah exactly and so i'm like guys you guys listen 
time flies. You don't want to be 50 and still single and thinking I should have. You know, if you're 50 and single because you went through a divorce, whatever, that's a different story. But if, if, it, if you never had the audacity or the courage to go talk to a girl that come on, get over yourself. Because I know that you like some of the girls here at church. Like we we live in a pretty awesome city. There's yeah, yeah. a lot of people that come to our church. Sure. Go talk to some of these girls. And so, you know, we were always encouraging me and Diana, like, come on, you guys, go invite some of these girls out. Diana has a lot of, you know, single, younger girls that are there around her at youth uh, when we were youth pastors. And so somebody coined that phrase. I think it was, it was Ricky. <laughs> I think it was Ricky. <laughs> and he's like, well, let's go do front lobby fellowship. And that's FLF. all these young guys were just in the front of the lobby uh, greeting all, everybody coming in. And it's like, especially the girls, especially the girls. <laughs> they were over the top of the girls. Welcome to church. What's your name? Is your first time here? But I'm like, at least that's how you meet something. Like you're not nice. going to meet somebody sitting down by yourself, coming in late, leaving early, you know, in a church with the amount of people that we have, yeah. you're going to meet a lot of good people. So like, I'm going to wait for the Lord to tell me. Yeah. It's, it's like, like, you're going to wait for a long, for a long time. Long time. Yeah. So, but you, yeah. No, okay. So I got it. So you didn't want to be, so you kept. Yeah. Going, so going I, I never want to be known as a guy that just Very talks good. to a bunch of girls. Like that's just what I didn't want to be. So when Andre and I started talking again, um, she was kind of like on the same page. Cool. So I was like, hey, let's make sure that this is something that we, you know, really would want to pursue and, yeah, and could see it going even further. Out, exactly. Nobody has to know exactly. that we were maybe talking, trying to see if it goes somewhere. That's what for I tell sure. people too. I say, hey, just take somebody out for coffee. Doesn't mean you're going to marry them. Doesn't yeah. mean, you know, uh, and obviously you keep it pure, all that. But but take out somebody for coffee. If there's any kind of chemistry, then you're like, man, I can see this. Cool, but you don't know unless you start going out with the person. You don't have to be dating, but get to know the person. Take them out somewhere. Go to watch a movie. Go hang out. After one or two, you're like, mm, no, we we don't. Yeah. That's not us. Cool. Then you know you guys. But but anyways, I think you did it right, and no, you've always been a, a stand up man and a man of character. Thank you. And man. so now looking back all these years and seeing you and Andrea and thriving and all that you guys are doing, thriving, thrive the plug. Um, That's right. I, I we love you guys. Me and Dan, I love you guys. And love you um, guys so much. Crazy uh, how God has now brought us all these years together. It's crazy. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about you. Yeah, uh, I obviously know you as you know you came in as a young guy into our youth ministry. You became one of our youth leaders. Uh, like I said, you've always be, been kind of like your wife. You guys are the same as far as like reserved people of character, <clears throat> people who are not too loud, too crazy. As far as, you know, there's people who are. Yeah, I get you. I get you're, you. I think both of you are a little bit more. Um, what's it called? Um, oh, my God. I'm, I'm blanked out on the word. Somebody that's uh, an intro, introvert. Introvert. Okay. Even though I think you're very talkative. Like yeah. we always say. You know, hey, somebody needs to go talk to this person. John, John, yeah, yeah, everybody goes yeah. to John. You, you are very much a people person, uh, but introvert in the sense like you, you and Andrea are not going to walk in somewhere and you guys are the center of attention because sure. you sure. guys want the attention. Right. It, it, that happens naturally because you guys are just um, awesome people. But I don't know John. Yeah. You've told me stories. I didn't know John growing up. For sure. So tell us a little bit about your story. Maybe were you born and raised here in Miami? I tell was. So that. Miami's all I know. Um actually I moved my family moved to Vegas when I was four. So we I lived in Vegas for a year. No way. Yeah. So I lived in Vegas. Every time I, I talk to you, you, you Something pull out new. like a rabbit Something crazy. out of a hat that I'm like, I did not know this about. You know me. those like two truths and a lie? Like yes. that's that's one yes. of the ones I always pull out. That's really good. Um so I lived in Vegas for one year when I was four. So um my biological father, he was born and raised in LA. Okay. Um, and so he came, actually the reason why he came down to Florida, funny story, he knew um, Tom Petty. So he used to date Tom Petty's niece. No way. And so uh, Tom Petty grew a liking to my dad. My dad can literally build anything. Like he's just a guy that he's a handyman, but can literally build a whole studio with his bare hands if he wanted to. Wow. So Tom Petty's like, hey, I want you to come down to Florida and work on my home. He wasn't dating his niece anymore. Met my mom down here. Um, and that's where uh, their relationship started. And so, so you were born here? I was born and raised in Miami. Okay. Yes, yeah, so born and raised in Miami. Um, my parents got a divorce um, when I was about seven. Okay. Um, and so my dad lived in Miami for about another year. Wait, so, so you were born and raised here, and you said at the age of four you go to Vegas? So four, we go to Vegas okay. um, because his parents were living out there. Cool. So his parents were living out there. You said you we lived were in Vegas for about a year? For about a year. So we, were, uh, we weren't doing well financially like okay. at all. So I, I remember literally one birthday where um, my dad built me something, and then the only gift I got was it was a coloring paper 
with some crayons. Oh, and wow. But I was like the happiest kid in the entire yeah. world with yeah. that. Um, and so I remember making a post about that. I saw that picture and literally like brought me to tears. Wow. Um, but there was a point where we literally had nothing. Um, and so, so you guys moved back down to South Florida. Moved back down to South Florida. Um, my dad had a really bad cocaine addiction. Okay. And so it was actually crack cocaine. And so it was to the point where um, he was selling my mom's car, selling her wedding ring, selling everything. Um, he would... Literally, he was like an apartment manager, would steal stuff from people's house, sell it, anything to be able to get the money. Yeah. So it just got to the point where- Going through a real tough addiction. Right, right. So my mom couldn't deal with it anymore. So they got divorced when I was about seven. So he stayed around till maybe about a year, year and a half, um, until the addiction got so bad where he's like, I, I don't want my son to see it. So he moved back to LA. Um, and uh, yeah, so when he moved out there, I didn't see my dad till I was about maybe 13. Wow. Um, but my stepdad came into the picture when I was about uh, eight or so. Wow. Um, so not too long after, it wasn't anything my mom was looking for. It was actually a birthday party my sister was invited to and he was just a stand-up guy and, and then they just stayed talking and oh, yeah, weird. my stepdad's my hero. He's uh, been the one that's taken me to every single basketball game I had, every every sport event, um, just always by my side. Him oh, and I, we go cool. shooting every month now and we grab lunch together. It's like, yeah, we look forward to those days. Uh, he's George. raised me. Yeah, George yeah. is awesome. Anybody he's... that's ever served in kids ministry, you know George. He's a yeah. short, bald guy, the yes. loudest guy on the <laughs> yes, entire planet. Absolutely. He's the opposite of an introvert. You'll, he, he, you'll hear him from the front patio easy. in our church from the kids. Yeah. Yes. ministry but yeah actually very opposite from an introvert yeah extrovert all the way like i see him sometimes i'm like i wish i can be like that's not naturally me yeah um but he's just the <clears throat> nicest kindest loudest the dude the most generous um, he right? really yeah, is he, he is. really really is and he loves kids and he I mean, you go to kids ministry and he's just having fun with all these kids. It's they call him the baby whisperer. Really? Every, every baby that is crying, they take him to him and they just stop crying. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's why. <laughs> so they love him. They love him. They're um, either, they love it or they're intimidated by it. Not yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Straight he's up. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, how's your, how's your father doing now? He's doing good. Um, so the way he, I know you guys now yeah, have so a relationship we talk, and. Um, yeah, we talk, we try to talk weekly um, yeah. or so. And, and cool. so uh, he's, he's doing a lot better. Actually, there was one time. Um, the reason he got over that addiction, he was at the verge of suicide and he literally makes like a, a prayer, like, God, if you're real, you're not going to let this happen. So he had a gun and he was about to pull the trigger, pulled the trigger and, and it just didn't go off. Oh, um, God. and so at that moment he kind of knew that a God was real and, uh, um, he went ahead, kind of started to get help when it came to everything with the crack cocaine. Um, and they went through like a series of other things that happened, yeah. you know, I think like pain medication, um, a whole bunch of other stuff, but, uh, he sent me a video maybe about two years ago. He got baptized at like a cowboy church. He's living in Idaho now. That is So he's amazing. been living in LA. He was living in LA prior for the last four years. He's been in Idaho. Wow. Got baptized at like this cowboy church. And I was about to say, cause so, I know you told me he was in Idaho. So I was like, yeah. okay, how did he end up? So he LA? moved. Uh, so, um, he's a hardcore conservative Republican being, <laughs> being a hardcore conservative Republican <laughs> in LA is yeah. pretty tough. Um, and so he was just so fed up of LA politics and so everything. He so he's like, yeah, I'm going straight to Idaho. Idaho I heard is amazing. He, uh, I keep showing him spots because there's literally spots away from him, like an hour away that are beautiful. Yeah. And I'm like, you need to go here, but he hasn't, he hasn't gone to any of these places I've seen yet. some of those spots of Idaho. Like I've seen it, like it comes across some of our feed. Me and Nana love Wyoming. Wyoming's right yes. next to Idaho. So we're like signed up to some of these like Instagram reels that show Western country life and all yeah. that. And sometimes we think it's Wyoming <clears> or Montana or, or Utah and it's Idaho. It's Idaho. Like, Idaho looks phenomenal. It looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So we got to go over there and hang with you. When Alex Papas was here, um, he's from Idaho. Yes. So him and I right. were just talking about like, he's like, bro, it's beautiful. There, he was showing me like this golf course that he would go to and wow. just literally just hang out at beautiful spots. I keep telling my dad, I'm like, yo, there are some spots by you that you have to go to because he's on the side where it's uh, borderline Oregon. Oh, okay. And so you Oregon, the the Oregon appears on my IG also all the incredible. time. Yes. It's yeah. beautiful. Um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with your biological father. Yeah. What's, what's yeah. his name? His name's Tim. Tim. So- um, you told me you didn't talk to him till you were 13. Yeah. So I was, uh, so he left to, out to LA when I was about nine. Um, I would speak to him maybe once a year on my birthday. Okay. Um, so it was the only time I'd speak to him. Um, you like remembered him? Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remembered him. Um, but I was kind of, I was angry as like a nine year old kid. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, with my dad. absolutely. Um, 
you know, these things I kind of find out over the last maybe 10 years or so. It's not your fault. You're nine. Not fault. You're, For sure. Your fault that it, and it's not his fault that he's battling with addiction, trying to get help while For sure. some stuff overpowers you. Thousand percent. Yeah. So he moves out. And then so I'm just like, I don't understand why my, my dad left. Um, and then obviously I hear my mom just complain. At the point we were living in an efficiency. And so it was me and my sister. And my mom living in an efficiency where my sister and I would share a bed. My mom would sleep on a couch. We then are able to get like a one bedroom apartment actually right across the street from Calvary where still my, my sister and I kept the room and my mom would sleep on the couch. My mom wow. did that forever. Like my mom just lived on the couch. She was single mom. We literally remember there was a store that we would have to go to called the poor store. Like that's what my mom called it. Like it was wow. like, oh yeah, we got to get food at the, at the poor store. Like, and that's just like what we were used to. That's what we would do. So you think about that and it's like, man, like my dad's not here. So as a nine year old, you start to kind of get a glimpse yeah. of everything that's going on. Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of had some anger towards my dad from about nine to 12, 13. I remember he would call and I'd be like, oh, like I, I don't want to talk to him. Mm -hmm. So at 13 years old, um, I am going to play at the American Airlines Arena with my basketball team. That's right. And so and basketball, you ball really was life. Basketball. Yeah. Ball was life. You played, I mean, basically I almost I your whole life. I played yeah. Yeah, pretty much my whole life yeah. um, until I got hurt uh, in high school. But I, yeah, basketball was everything. So I was going to play in the American Airlines Arena, and this was like the biggest deal in the world to me. And so at that point, we were talking a little bit more. He found out, and so he was doing a lot better. Um, and so he came down to visit wow. and he drove down and he, he came to watch me at, uh, at my, at the, at the basketball game and came to like my practice before we got Beautiful. to hang out for, after, before. Um, but even like, I remember, uh, so right after the game, he had to, he had to he get going. And, uh, I remember like being in the bathroom of the American Airlines arena. And I'm literally like crying, like, like, man, there goes my dad again. Like, and wow. he's just leaving again. And so, yeah, at 13, it was, it was tough. And then, um, I saw him again when I was like 15, I saw him again when I was maybe 18 and then, um, or no, probably like, no, like 20. Uh, and then my wedding day. So we've seen each other maybe like five times since I was 13. Yeah. Um, but we talk, we talk often. And, wow. and so there's been, there's been like a lot of reconciliation there. We, we just try to chat. And so, um, nice. yeah, it's cool. It's cool. That is awesome. But, yeah. I remember but yeah it was tough though. I think he visited a few, several years ago. He was down here. Wasn't he, he? Was the last time he was here was my wedding. Okay, so, so, so I think that's 20, when I saw him. So that's probably where you met him. You probably yes. met him at my wedding. And we talked a little bit, and I just, you, you, anybody who knows you, I think your name is fitting. You are <laughs> the disciple of love. You, ah, you're a man that. with so much love. Um, you're genuine. You're you are compassionate. You're kind. And I remember seeing you with your dad, and you told me it's my dad. Blah blah blah. We talked. Um, I just think it's a beautiful picture of reconciliation yeah, and what's yeah, happened no doubt. and um, you having grace for him and what he went through and all of that. And I think it's a beautiful picture where you didn't let it jade you, incarcerate you, didn't, you didn't yeah. let it um, bring you down to a season of just bitterness or resentment. Sure. What, what do you think helped you there? Uh, I oh, mean, obviously yeah. the gospel. I uh, know for sure. Well, gospel, yes. Um, I can talk, I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Another huge part was having like an actual father figure there yeah. too. Um, and I think that was, that was something that was really difficult for my biological dad when he first heard me call uh, George dad. Mm. Um, but I remember even when that happened where I was, I was playing flag football and um, I had a, a teammate that's like, hey, why don't, you, why don't you call him dad? Because I was calling him George. Hey, George, hey, George. Yeah. And he's like, why don't you call him dad? I'm like, well, he's, he's not my dad. And he's, and he's like, yeah, but he's here. And I remember that. And then I had a basketball coach. Um, in seventh or eighth grade, I remember he's taking me home, and this guy was—he's he's a man of God. Uh, shout out to Coach Shane. Uh, he was taking me home, and he would always just take time and just speak life into me. And he would literally—we'd sit outside my house for sometimes an hour, and he would just talk life into me. And uh, there was this one time he's talking to me, and he goes, uh, "Hey, I just want to let you know something." He goes, "Your father is not the one who helps give birth to you. Your father is the one that raised you, wow. raises you." And uh, that just stuck with me. And I think it was that moment where I'm like man, this is my, this is my dad. Like I, he's, he's there. He loves me there. Like the relationship me and my stepdad have is like, there is no like step. He treats me a hundred percent. Like I'm his son and I treat him a hundred percent. Like my dad, like there is literally no difference. His biological son, which is my little brother. Like there is an equal love wow. for how me and my brother are with my stepdad. And wow. so seeing that, um, that's something that for sure, like was just 
was beautiful in my life where it's like I still had an incredible father figure in my life that was just there consistent um has loved me through and through has been you know mentor best friend in my life so oh, uh that's that's been huge like that's been that's been it um and then yeah by, by the grace of god just god is so good yeah um and yeah. it's just shown like how can we f not forgive when god has forgiven us so much that's right um time and time again and so um but yeah even just like following jesus uh my family was super inconsistent so we've been a part of calvary forever like, I know. I know you tell me yeah. stories. I mean, you were super young when you started attending Calvary. So we would we attended Calvary since I was, um, I think, I don't even think my mom was dating George yet. Wow. So it was like probably right after the divorce. Um, so it was probably eight before we had the 1.0. Yeah. My mom and I put stakes into the ground. <laughs> wow. uh, and so I think there was like kind of seasons where uh, my mom had gone through some, maybe some other issues that it's like, all right, let her to Christ, let her stronger. And then life pulls away. Yeah. So growing up, we were pretty inconsistent as a family. It was like, go oh, one week. So it's not like you would go every single No, week. no. Yeah. So um, like, I wish I got to be like Mikey Koyasa, who grew up in the youth ministry <laughs> and got to go to every camp and everything. Like, I, I didn't. Um, I never went to the youth ministry. I My family would go one week, miss four or five weeks. Did, um, did you, during that whole time, did you have like a, a belief in God? Because you had an idea yes. of God obviously going, but is this something that was yep. like forefront in your life like yeah. you're like okay i know there's a god did you live with that consciousness of yeah, god yeah a or? thousand percent so I, I i can even think middle school i think god gave me incredible conviction from a young age um i went to a private school for middle school and they had an award in eighth grade for most christ-like and i remember winning that award no in, way in eighth grade <laughs> um and so there was like a there was like a desire there was like a um a genuine want um it just if like you're not going to church all the time. It's just going to be different. So yeah. um, I started going to this small youth ministry in high school. Like it was like my 10th grade until basketball season started. Um, so even through high school, did you live with that conviction? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Even if you weren't going to church consistently? So the conviction started to go away probably my, my, my junior year probably of high school Okay, is when I was like, oh, there's girls around and yeah. oh, there's parties and oh, my friends are doing this. And it's like, I just kind of want to go do what my friends are doing. Got it. Um, and so that's when we started going out a lot of Fridays, a lot of Saturdays. I think I, I didn't go out a lot more earlier because I never wanted to be a burden to my parents. So I was like, oh, I don't want them to have to take me to places. They're always yeah. complaining. They're tired and all that stuff. So once my friends started driving, it was like, all right, come, all right, come pick me up. Yeah. Come, let's go hang. So then is that when you were still attending that youth group? No, no. So I only went to that youth group for a little bit. I went to that youth group for maybe three months. Um, and, and then I went to like an actual youth camp experience with there. Um, so there I met one of my best friends in the entire world. Uh, his name's Johnny. Um, and so him and I, we still talk almost every day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm grateful for that youth camp. And it, it, uh, it did something in your life. It, it did something. You. It, was a, it was a Pentecostal Assemblies of God youth camp. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd ever seen spoken in tongues. Yeah. I've <laughs> never seen that in my entire life. And so there's a moment where the guy leading worship or the guy preaching, he's like, all right, everybody speak in tongues right oh now. And so everybody starts speaking in tongues. I'm looking around. I don't know what to do. So what? I'm like, no. oh, no, 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 no. like, I just started like, bro, I had no idea what was happening. And so I was like, I just feel like I got to do something because everybody else around me is doing something. <laughs> How uh, old are you? Bro, so I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, 15. I think I'm 15 at that <laughs> point. 15 or 16. Yeah. Well, props to you. I think at 15, most of us would be like, I'm out of yeah, here. I'm I mean, going back to my I mean, you're cabin. in the middle of nowhere. So this it's like, wild. I can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went to that youth camp. Uh, but it, it, at the end of the day, as weird or as crazy as that, all that may sound to uh, some of us, it, it marked you. It did. A, a thousand percent. But so that was sophomore. I, it was either freshman going to sophomore or sophomore going to junior. Um, and then I stopped going to that youth group. I don't know. Why, oh, I guess like basketball was all taken over. So yeah. uh, stopped going and then never went to Calvary Youth or anything like what that. What high school did you go to? I went to Terra. Okay, so you were playing on the basketball team. I was, yeah. So and JV, then you stopped going to youth. Yeah, so stopped going to, to that youth group. But you still lived with a conviction of God, as yeah, far so, as like a, a consciousness of God. A thousand percent. So I'm at at, the, at these parties, um, and then again, you start getting interested in girls, start uh, people are introducing you to alcohol. But I always had a conviction. I never touched a drug in my life, wow. um, and I saved myself till marriage. Like those are two things that even as I was doing things, like I felt God just gave me a conviction for wow. like, hey, wow. never touch a drug, um, save yourself. And so even Do you think it's because like the seed of the gospel was in your heart. I think so. Yeah. I, I, I think so. Um, even when it was some sort of like, hey, you're rebelling, you're leading away. As a matter of fact, it was right after I graduated my senior year. Um, and it was probably the time, again, I was going out the most. Uh, we had a friend that was leaving to Florida State, which I 
tell everybody I will never let my future kids go to Florida State <laughs> University. Um, and so they'll never go to Town Nasty. Um, so my friend was going to Florida State. And so I, uh, would, I remember drinking too much at this party. I'm in the backseat of, you know, Julio, my friend Julio's Mustang. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember we were in this pool. I remember being in this pool in my underwear. Uh, like, it was just like, <laughs> like, it was just stupid. Um, I'm in the backseat of, my, my, of Julio's Mustang. And I literally felt God say, you're lost and you need to come back to me. And that was a Monday night. And um, I was like, is this the alcohol talking? Like, what's happening right now? Wow. Um, and then that was a Monday night. Tuesday, they had just started Wynwood services on Tuesday nights. So we were, we were, me and my friends were all hanging out at Wynwood prior, just going to hang out, Bob. So um, I text Julio and a couple other of my friends. I'm like, hey, my church is doing this thing in Wynwood tonight. Would you want to come? And I was like, uh, they were like, yeah, sure, we'll come. So Julio came with me and another friend of mine came with me. And, and um, it was the night that I just remember saying, God, like, I just want to completely surrender my life to you. Because I knew I had a relationship with Jesus. I remember being a young kid where Pastor JP was the kid's pastor. I remember giving my life to Jesus as like a young kid, but wholeheartedly surrendering my, my life to Jesus was uh, August of 2014 um, on that Tuesday night. Yeah. Wow. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. A couple months ago. Yeah. Wow. Yep. And so the night before, you're in the back of this Mustang, back yep. of this car, and you sense... You're lost. Yeah. You need to come Staying back lost to and come back to the Lord. Wow. And so didn't know what that looked like. And that's what that Tuesday night. And um it's just he, like a strong impression in your heart. Yeah. 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 I, I wouldn't say it was like a audible voice. Audible voice. But you felt but it. it was a strong impression in my heart. And it was just And like, this is why you guys are partying, all having a good time. You just yeah. left the pool, whatever. Just like and you this. just are like, wait, yep. what yep. am I doing? Yep. And so I just knew um all right. You know, that's why I tell people when when God has a call over your life when you can't run from God. It's true. I know a lot of people that have tried running from God, that tried running away from God. When God literally has a plan and a purpose for your life, when he wants to save you, he'll reach you wherever you are. You can run, but you can't hide. That's right. And so here you are in the back of this car after a party, all that. There's been alcohol, the pool, all that. And you hear this voice and it's God like, John, come home. Yeah. Come home. Yeah. And the next day, next day, you go and you surrender your and life. And it's like, who has Tuesday night services too? <laughs> yeah, I And so right. the fact that there was just uh, this Tuesday service uh, that happened to be going on and, and um, yeah. 2014. 2014, August of 2014. Wow. Um, and then I ended up getting baptized. And I remember like my family, every time we'd go, we happened to like just have missed a baptism Sunday or just want to go. Literally every time we would go as a family to church, it was a new series. Yeah. Uh, like that's how often we we'd go <laughs> every five um, six weeks. Let's go back to church. So yeah. we'd always be like, all right, uh, yeah, we're gonna we'll we'll get baptized that next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll get baptized that next time. And I know there's people in our church probably like this. Yeah, and it's like yeah, yeah, yeah the next time, the next time. For sure. But when God changed my life in August of 2014, I was like, I have to get baptized wow. now. And so baptism Sunday happened to be uh, like two weeks after that. And so on a Saturday, um, actually. Uh, Pastor Phil was one of the guys that baptized me. Wow. And so I was literally sending him the pictures a couple months ago. I was like, yo, um, 10 years ago today. Insane. John, question. Yeah. You had friends, obviously, that you were partying with, all that yep, senior yep. year of school. When you get saved that Tuesday night or when you really fully surrender that Tuesday night, what does that look like with your friendships? Yep, yeah. What is, what is that? So um, we, so me and, and my friend Julio, we start going every single week to the Wynwood campus. Mm -hmm. So we start going Tuesdays. It switches over to Sundays. We're there on Sundays. Um, and so now we're still trying to hang with our friends, and it's just different. So now it's like, hey, you want to drink? No, I'm good. Yo, you were just drinking with us a couple weeks ago. What are you talking about? Uh, I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that anymore. And it's just weird. So it got to a point where, uh, unfortunately, I had to let go of 99% of my friends. Yeah. Like I just, it, it did. And it was one of these things where I regretted for a while because I remember then trying to invite some friends to church and they were like, man, you haven't even talked to us in years. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. now you're trying to invite us to church. Like, what's the deal? Um, but it was something I needed. Like I needed to At least let go. Yes. I needed to let go of all my friends. Um, and then, um, so it was pretty much just me and my friend Julio. We were there at, at Wynwood every week. Uh, FLFing, front well, lobby what, fellowshipping. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to, um, you know, maybe there's some people watching, they're in that stage right now where maybe they just recently made a decision to follow Jesus, uh, but they got some friendships that are more dragging them down, pulling them yeah. down instead of helping them up. 
to their God-given purpose. What are some things that helped you not to go back to the drinking or the party yep, or all yep. that? Uh, even though maybe it wasn't a crazy wildlife, but some, what are some things that you can tell people today to help them stay focused in this new season? Yeah, um, I think who you surround yourself around is everything. It's 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 everything. Um, I remember, again, uh, I had to let go of all my friends. If not, I would have been right back into the same cycle because reality is you're going to be wherever your friends are. Yeah. And so if your friends are at parties, it's like, hey, my friends are there, so that's why I'm going to be there. And if you're just around something enough, you're going to end up partaking. You're going to end up being a part of it, especially if you haven't grown in the fruit of self-control in that area. Um, literally, it was great. I literally just had my 10-year, we had like a little mini 10-year reunion. And it was awesome to just be able to be around the guys I went to high school with over 10 years ago and be like, man, I could be a man of God around these guys and it's just, and still be boys with everybody awesome. and still be cool with everybody. But for a season, you have to separate yourself. Yeah. But my best friends in the entire world are all people I've met in the church. Wow. Um, and literally, if you just give your life to saying, God, what is it that you have for me? Give your life to serving in the church, being in the church. God will rearrange your whole community. He'll rearrange everything. So it's like, hey, before where my friends were at these parties I'm going to go to, and my friends are at church. We're at these church events. We're at Connect Group. Um, and so I literally just think of the groomsmen at my wedding. 70% um, of them were people I've met in the church. Uh, I had, yes, one, one guy that was a childhood friend of mine since we were eight. Um, one guy that is one of my best friends that we met in college. But besides that, I was like, we all met in the church and, and yeah. that's been the, the best thing, but the most needed thing. Yeah. I think you don't lose things. You replace things. Yes. Like God replaces things. And yeah, you, you may lose some friendships. You may lose. And it's hard to, uh, like you said, say no to certain things, say no to certain nights. Hey, Bob, you guys are going to start drinking, acting crazy. I'm good. I'm leaving. I've had that conversation with people where you got to do that. And some old friends may get upset, uh, but slowly but surely God begins to replace and give you some yeah. friends that are solid, have the same vision, same spirit, same mind. Like, hey, we want to stay consecrated, holy, living for him. So um, I think your life is a beautiful testament of that. As you transition yeah. there from being this guy who was partying out and about to, oh, wait, hold on, I want to. I, I give him my life. Uh, I remember sometime after that, maybe, you know, the date uh, where you walked in, me and Anna were youth pastors, and you walked in and you started, you became a leader, like, I want to serve you on Friday nights. Yeah, so it was, uh, we had the first encounter conference 2015, so this was January 2015, and so um, I remember being like, hey, should I serve this conference or uh, should I sit in? And somebody was like, hey, just sit in, like, yeah. don't don't serve, like, you, you've been serving a lot of Winwood, just, just enjoy. Yeah. So um, I was like, all right, I'm going to take in the conference, and man, just the message is spoken. Um, I remember there was a message spoken by Sanga Samways mm -hmm. and his testimony was exactly mine. Wow. And it was just the craziest thing to me that literally the exact same story identical. of how God met me, uh, almost identical to like the impression that he felt, um, in the same moment. Um, it was like, man, we weren't living these crazy lifestyles, but just drifting away from God. But the same way God spoke, I was like, man, like that's like, this man is a man of God, and look how God's using him in an incredible yeah. way. Yeah. I remember that that being something that super impacted me. So uh, conference ends. Um, I remember at the time I get asked to go share something on, on stage about what God did at Counter Conference. And, um, I think we have a picture of that. Yeah, we have a picture. Yes, and, yes. And uh, I remember Pastor asked, um, he goes, hey, do you ever see yourself as a pastor? And I'm like, I'm like word fumbling. Like, oh, he's like, he goes, oh, I think there's a pastoral gift over wow, your life. Wow. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> uh, go sit back down. <laughs> My mom's sobbing in the front row. Wow. Um, and then the Wednesday following, um, there was a Wednesday night, just midweek service that we used to have. And um, one of the guys that was one of the youth pastors, he saw him, comes up to me and he's like, hey, I felt God tell me you're supposed to be helping lead at youth and wow. you should be youth leader. And so I think you should uh, come on, join in. And I remember joining on in and it being super weird. I don't know anybody. They're just like, <laughs> hey, go stand at a door. Um, and then stack um, up chairs. Yeah, stack up chairs, <laughs> clean a lot of toilets, yeah. cleaned a lot of toilets <laughs> for many years. Um, but it was just some of the things that formed me and, and then serving and just God expanding, growing different things. And yeah. um, at about 21 years old, I felt the call to ministry and yeah. um, I was ready. What did, what did that look like? Yeah. So I remember um, I'm at FIU. I'm on my third year at FIU. And what were you studying? I was studying finance. Okay. So I was a finance major and I really thought, oh, well, all my other friends were studying finance too. So I was like, oh, we're all going to be finance bros. Literally all my friends, they were all, they're in Goldman Sachs. Uh, they're Today. making, yeah, they're making like 
crazy goo goo money. Wow. And um, and I remember I'm in this uh, finance club at FIU, and these guys are just passionate about staying up late, waking up early, building up their portfolios for uh, the stock market, all these things. And I'm like, I remember sitting in this meeting and being like, I have zero passion for this. And the only thing on my mind is, I wish I was at church right now, just building church or like doing something church related wow. and just feeling I just want to spend the rest of my life building church. And so um, I'm 21 years old and I remember going home and uh, I think there might've been some sort of conference nearby and tell my dad like, Hey, I think I'm going to leave FIU and go straight to Bible college. My dad's like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Like hey, hold, you only, on. you only have one more year left. Yeah, like finish, just, finish. just finish up. And I'm like, okay. So I was fighting finance and I'm like, all right, let me see if there's something I could switch to that would be a little bit more. So you ended up getting your degree in finance. So I didn't No. So I, sw I was able to switch to business management. Okay. Okay. Cause I felt like, uh, I, I could learn more tools there that yeah. would help me in ministry. Um, so I switched, I got my under undergrad in business management and then immediately I did my master's uh in theology and yeah. biblical studies yeah. so I did that at Liberty University uh but you just knew you didn't know what it was gonna look like but you just knew I'm gonna I didn't serve know what God it was gonna for look the rest like. of my life I just knew I was gonna serve God for the rest of my life yeah. I knew there was a call for full-time ministry wow. um and I knew that I could not see myself doing anything else in the entire world wow uh so I just I just I I just knew it and I was ready to just give my life to it so um so I went and got and studied ministry I was working at FIU for a long time you were um, working at FIU, I remember. We used to talk yeah. a lot. You were there at FIU. Um, yep. The whole time while you were there, are you thinking, like, I can't wait to, like... Yeah, I was... I had I had such an awesome boss. She was so kind. She was also a woman of God. Um, her name was Sophie. And she just knew, like, how much I love the church mm. and how much I love ministry. Um, but she also knew that, like, I'm at FIU and I'm, I'm doing it. I was like, God, I'm, you know, this is where you have me. Yeah. And so, but I'm miserable. I don't want to be there. Yeah. Um, it's not fulfilling. I'm like, I, oh, God, I just, I just know there's nothing else on my mind. I would spend more hours probably doing church stuff and a lot of stuff for youth ministry and, and a lot of other stuff, um, while I'm working yeah. and uh, the, the job allowed me to like be pretty flexible, like on when we're actually working. So man, I spent a lot of time. I, I wrote a lot of messages and sermons during wow. work time or whenever wow. I could, um, or I would stay there till late and whatever cafe I could find to wow. be able to write my sermons and uh or just whatever anything yeah, church related you're, you're I spent that's where right? I spend most of my, my my time so I was like I'm gonna just use whatever time I can wow. and so uh, um, FIU, FIU is a phenomenal phenomenal is. university here it in is. South Florida I love it. Uh, we love it and you were there for a long time you also have a passion for education I do um I remember you got your undergrad then you went you got your master's um then you were working at FIU uh today if people don't know you lead CLS um, Calvary you Leadership are School. The pastoral lead. I call you the dean of Calvary <laughs> Leadership I'll take it. School. I'll take it. And you've done such a phenomenal job. And Thank I've you. said this uh, at our church, but in case there's listeners that that are not part of Calvary, um, I had a dream of one day our church having a university. Like I've wanted our church to have a college, a university where people can get a degree in biblical studies, uh, have some theological uh, framework, good framework. Um, at a very low cost. I'm like, Lord, help us one day. And, you know, I grew up in church, so I know some churches that have done it, some churches that have tried to do it, some churches that have done it really well. And I'm like, Lord, give us that. Like, I know I'm passionate about that, too. I want people, uh, especially young people who really want to get a degree in biblical studies to be able to do it, come out with little to no debt, all that kind of stuff. So I had an idea, and I remember I finally I pitched you the idea and I'm like, I want maybe this two, three year program. One day we're gonna make it a four year program. We'll see what happens. But, uh, and you came back. I mean, I'm talking about like, bro, what you showed me was absolutely wild. It was literally what I had envisioned. We had tried with, you know, before we had partnered up with another university and it didn't go uh, the way I wanted it. Uh, so we had tried Calvary College to a certain degree. Uh, but I'm like, this is what I want. I want us to do this, whether we have a university backing us up or not, we're gonna start it. We're gonna do it on our own, you know? Um, yeah. And you came back with an incredible two-year program. You now turned it into a three-year program. Um, but I just love your passion for it, your dedication for it. Um, you, I think CLS, and I know I'm being biased, obviously, but um, it's excellent. Like, it is excellent. The level of class. I have a friend of mine that has been in church his whole life. And he says, I've learned now more through CLS wow. than anything else. He started coming to our church over the last year. I've known him for a very long time. And he says, CLS has changed my life. Wow. And so you're doing an incredible Thank job so leading Seriously. that. Is education, getting people uh, the right, proper education, even theology, something that's always been on your mind now the last few years. Uh, yeah. I don't know, where does that so, passion so come So before from? getting on staff at, uh, at Calvary, I just I had my master's for a little bit. 
I was actually going to start trying to teach at FIU as a professor. Um, they really? have they have like some basic classes for intro New Testament, intro Old Testament. Um, I just love to teach. Like I, I really do. I genuinely enjoy it. I love it. Um, and so I, I I have a passion for people getting equipped and to grow into the calling and plan that God has over their life. Mm. And so I think we can't grow into the calling over our life unless we know the one who gives us the calling. That's right. And uh, the more that we embrace him, the more that we choose him, the more that we, and it's so much more just knowledge, but the Bible does tell us that our people perish for lack of knowledge. That's right. And so I think the more that we get to know God, the get to, more we get to know ourselves too. Um, and so I do, generally do have a passion for that. I, I was going to teach at FIU, but the opportunity to be able to teach CLS, I'm, I'm grateful because um, you gave me that opportunity to do so. And it's been a dream. It's been amazing. Um, one of the coolest things that happened this week, I talked to two different people that don't go to our church that are a part of Calvary Leadership School. And one girl was telling me how she's taking everything that, that she's taking at her church and she's bringing it to her church. And the church is like, hey, that Bible college you are at, stay there wow. because it is blessing our church. No. And I happen to be, um, funny story, we went, my, we, my family went to this one little church that like my grandma went to for a long time, but we went there for a little tiny bit. Um, and so I knew the church, like uh, one of my really close friends, they're really uh, good at that church. So, so she was shocked that I, I knew of the church because it's a small church, but she's like, I'm taking everything. Like I'm, uh, we're literally transferring what you give us and it's uh, all being filtered into our wow. church and growing. And I was like, it's awesome. So it's, it's being a tool for the kingdom of God. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I love that our church has grown so much. Yeah. I think the people in our church have been hungry. The yeah. people in our church have been, uh, they could defend themselves with biblical literacy. They, yeah have a closer and deeper relationship. And because of that, the fruit stems into everything that's happening that's right. in our church as well. So Sunday teachings, you're going through a series on the tabernacle <laughs> and our church is excited about yeah. it. Yeah, it's like it's wild. crazy. Yeah. I, I, I was talking to Chris Palmer and Nathan Finocchio and uh, they were, they were talking about like someone doing like a class on like an old Testament book. And they're like, Oh yeah. Like nobody would show up to that. We have almost hundred people sign up to do the cl like a class on Isaiah, yeah, yeah, like on, on Isaiah, which is, yeah. which is, it's a difficult book if you're just reading it at face value yeah. um but the church has grown so hungry that they're I like hey it. whatever it is we just want to learn we just want to grow and the people have literally taken out of their every tuesday for the last couple years yeah. um to be able to grow and learn it's it's beautiful and i'm grateful every single day for it uh, i love you john and uh, that story you just shared i think your life is a testament of that um of the one of this girl taking it back to her church um, you've lived your life, uh, at least the last nine, 10 years I've known you like that. You, you're, you live your life with open hands and whatever God gives you, I always see you are so generous. You are so kind the, the, the amount of time that you spend with people, helping people out, teaching people, it doesn't go unnoticed. I know God sees it, know that we see it. Um, but obviously more than us seeing it, God sees it. Uh, but you live this way. And I think that when we are faithful with the little, God's going to give us much. And yeah. I think that's the way you've lived your life. Um, at least for the time that I've known you, you have always been so faithful, so kind, so reverent, uh, so generous. And uh, you literally, you literally, anything that God gives you, you give it to people. You, you you are as generous as they come. And, and I think when you live your life with an open hand, it allows for blessings to continue to come. People who hold blessings, people who say, no, this is all mine. God has given me this. I'm holding on to it. It just has a way of turning off the faucet of heaven and the blessings stop coming down. Um, but I think that's why God continues to bless you, you and Andrea, why God continues to elevate you. Um, speaking of Nathan and um Chris, they've been phenomenal. Nathan Finocchio and Chris yeah. Palmer, they're not going to help turn CLS into an accredited That's right. university. That's right. And so what we dreamed about years ago is going to happen, God life. willing, over the next few months and yeah. year. And so we're excited about that. And then also, um, I know we, we've been here a while, but excited about you and Andrea starting Young Adults. That's right. That is going to be absolutely, absolutely. amazing. Oh, man. This is a, a dream, like yeah. an a absolute dream. Yeah, in case the listeners don't know, our church for a long time, we've had a youth group. Uh, we've had, obviously, our connect groups, and we have our church. Uh, but there's always been, we think, that age. Like, what do you do when you leave uh, youth group? You're 18, 19, 20, 21, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm not in youth group anymore. I'm part of, like, you know, the adult church, which is fine. But you always, and we had connect groups. For sure. Uh, and you and Andrea have even been leading those connect groups. Um, but now we're just going to take things next level. I went to a church where we had young adults 
Um, and it just it does help you just, okay, let me get around a community of people. Yeah. And so you and Andrea are now going to be leading our young adult so cool. ministry. Yeah. And so excited. I'm excited about that. Is there any information you can share? Yeah. Another um, gathering or something? So we are um, hopefully starting very soon. Okay. We have the things are so much to unpack <laughs> for it uh so much dreaming and and so much is happening uh we're working on the the branding and we just want it to be a place where um literally just three big things one where anybody's gonna come they're gonna meet jesus anybody's gonna come they're gonna find incredible community so we're being so intentional where anybody is just when they step in they're gonna feel so loved embraced taken in from the moment they step in um and they're gonna grow into the calling over their life Very cool. and so um the way it's structuring, I know um, still working through that as well, getting yeah. approval on certain things. Um, Dream-wise, we definitely want it to be, hopefully, even like once a month gatherings yeah. um, where people are just so excited. The moment they walk in, it's like, I need to be a part of this. Very Throughout cool. the rest of the weeks, there's community happening all over the city every yeah. single week. So young adults will be gathering all over, whether they're doing Bible studies on one week, they're gathering just to hang out other weeks, and then pushing everybody onto the local church as well. So pushing people to uh, the prayer worship nights that we have on the first Wednesday of the month. And, and that's just the goal where we want to get People not just throw big events because anybody yeah. I think can throw big yeah. events. Clubs throw big events. That's right. Rappers throw big events. Yeah. We don't want to just throw great events. We want it to be a place where literally life change is happening. I love and it. And so, um, yeah, I'm pumped. I'm I pumped. love Andreas it. I love pumped. you. We've dreamed about this for years, prayed through this for years. So we're so excited. Let's go. Well, no, me and Dan, I love you guys. Love Our you. church loves you. Um, I honestly think, and I know, again, once again, we're extremely biased, but I think we have the greatest team on the planet when I think about um, you guys, you, Andrea. Um, you know, you got Adam, Brooke, Phil, Danny. You got Louis, Sorry, uh, Raquel. Uh, Vlad, like I look at our entire team, Arnold, Tyra, I can keep going on and yeah. on, but we're spoiled. God has given us Come such on. an incredible family um, and people love you in our church. People love you yeah. and Andrea. You guys are the real deal. And so me and Dan, I love you. We thank you for all that you guys, you guys have so done. Much. But more importantly, I say this to people all the time, what you do is cool, but who you are is, is actually thank more you. important. So uh, this was cool. I, I know there's still a so, lot to so. talk about, so we'll do a part yeah, two. Yeah, I'm pumped. But thank you for sharing a little bit no, of your story. Thank you for being here. I love you, and uh, the best is yet to come. Keep your ears love peeled you. for your ears peeled. Keep your <laughs> ears open and your <laughs> eyes peeled for some young adult information coming uh, for South Florida, and we're excited about come it. On. I love come you, on. brother. I love you so much. Let's go. Seriously, grateful for you. Let's and uh, I'm just grateful that Andre and I get to follow the greatest pastors on the entire planet. And so I love you and Diana so much. Love you. So, love you. Love you. Thank you, my brother. Remember, if you change yourself, you can change your world. Let's go.